Hey everybody, really quick, I wanted to let you know about a cool opportunity. My University of Louisville Music Therapy Clinic that I coordinate is now offering telehealth, music therapy, and ukulele webinar classes. If you've ever thought you'd want to learn the ukulele, now's the time. Check it out. You can go on Instagram at U of L M T C or you can check out our website at www.louisville.edu slash music slash MTC. Check it out. And if you want to learn ukulele, I'll teach you over the internet. On to the episode. Hey, welcome back to Make More Music, the podcast that connects people to music and one another. My name's Chris, and I'm a board-certified music therapist. If you're joining in for the first time, I interview different music and music-related field professionals just to show the variety of career paths, to witness what awesome people are doing in music-related fields, and ultimately just to encourage you to make more music, because I believe that a more musical world is a better world. And today I have an awesome artist um, in another installment in our social distance suite. This one's really timely. Jacory 1200 Arthur is a artist, a uh, hip hop composer, a music educator, a political activist, all kind of rolled into one. He wears all of these identities very authentically and he talks about his social responsibility um, through his artwork and through just being an authentic person. And I think you're really going to enjoy this one. If you're someone in the Louisville area, he talks about resources during all of this COVID-19 pandemic and is just an inspiring person. So sit back, enjoy this one with Jacory 1200 Arthur. All right, Jacory 1200. It's so awesome to have you on here. Uh, I've been kind of seeing you parallel to my journey. I don't know exactly what years you were at U of L, but I remember seeing like, man, this guy did this really epic like Beethoven the Fifth, you know, rap thing. And I remember the white that all the choir people were wearing and the red background. I remember seeing that a long time ago and thinking, wow, that is, that is powerful. So it's funny now being back in Louisville, I've kind of like seen all your stuff and we were planning on meeting in person, but you know, we're uh, staying at home and washing our hands and doing our part and stuff like that. But uh, it's good to have you on, man. Everything going okay at, at your residence Everything is everything. I'm glad to be here. Thank you so much for having me. Another uh, fellow U of L grad, so it's good to reconnect. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Well, um, before we get into your whole story and everything, I just want to do some rapid fire real quick. Let's go in and the questions are short. Your answers don't have to be, but I want you to open up whether it's you know Apple or Spotify or whatever you listen to music with. And what is the last track you played? Spotify and the last track I played was I forgot the artist but it was a, a piano mix of different black composers such as Florence Price and William Grant Still so every night when I'm putting my son to bed we always listen to music classical music specifically by, by black composers just to get him exposed to that art form at an early age and most of the music that we hear also settles him that's, re that's really sweet. Um, so question number two, you can take this as philosophical or, you know, as plainly as you want, but if you were an instrument, what would you be? I would probably be a piano because it has the widest range sonically, tonally, and I would consider myself to be a person of many ranges and many hats and responsibilities and, and outlooks. So I would definitely be a piano. Mm. And throwing in the percussion element too. I'm excited. I'm excited to get into all the things that you do and all the irons you have in the fire, if you will. Uh, this should be a good one too. What's something that's been inspiring you recently? I've been doing a lot of response work 
in the in the midst of our pandemic and it has been very inspiring to just be working with other organizers in different capacities for the past five or so years i've mostly been doing my organizing work in a silo mostly around arts and education but recently i've been teaming up with people who are in housing people who are in uh, reproductive restorative justice criminal justice reform you name it and it has just been kind of like forming Voltron to come together with the other activists and organizers <laughs> to to make our city a better place so that has been very motivating just to see how they function and to also know that we're never alone in this world any kind of work that we do there's always someone or someones that are fighting for what you're fighting for yeah since we're going to try and push this one out really quickly. What would you say for any local listeners are some organizations if somebody wants to respond and want to help? Who would you point people towards? So when you go to my website, my personal, my campaign website, Jacory Arthur, J-E-C-O-R-E-Y-A-R-T-H-U-R.com, at the very top, there is a link to a document that is a Louisville Mutual Aid document that has been spearheaded by Black Lives Matter ran by Chanel Helm, but it has contributors from all over the city and everything from housing to food resources to educational materials are in that document. And it's made by the people and for the people. So anything you need to be connected to as far as responding to COVID-19, jacoryarthur.com and those resources are all compiled through that Black Lives Matter Louisville Mutual Aid document. Awesome. Awesome. I'll be sure to link to that. What, on a maybe a slightly different note, what is a pro tip, a life hack, something that you do that you feel like people should know about? They should, they should put it into practice in their life. Google Calendar or Outlook Calendar or you know Apple Calendar, whatever calendar software you want to use. I started using Google Calendar in college. And it changed my life in terms of just organization and structure. Because when I know I have that paper due or I need to study something, I set the time aside in the calendar and do it. I don't procrastinate on it. Or if I know that I need to block off time to practice or I need to work on anything, I put that in my calendar so I can stay organized. And I know so many people who I respect and love and honor who have paper calendars, but it makes you lose efficiency because if you don't have your paper calendar next to you or if you got to constantly revise it why not just make it digital so you can always change it up as much as you need to and wherever you are so google calendar is my favorite platform but there's so many different digital calendars you have to stay organized yeah i don't know if you're anything like me but as kind of like uh i'm definitely that kind of like adhd somewhat scatterbrained like creative type. And it took a long time before I ever got to that point where I was like, uh, Oh, I, I don't need a calendar or whatever. And now like my life would collapse if I wasn't using Google. I use Google for my regular outside of work and outlook for everything at work. And I don't know if that's the same for you, but I feel like my life would crumble <laughs> if they went away. Yeah. Life is really just, if you think about it, almost parallel to music is a division of time so the music is divided by time otherwise all the music would be completely silent all the time or it would be completely just ha ah, all the time so the pauses are very important but the way we divide time in our lives is also important so when you can kind of understand how that time works and what those divisions and breaks are it'll just make your life run a lot more fluidly all right. And next, this is always a fun one. What is your go-to junk food? Mm. I love honey buns, but you got to heat them up in the microwave Man. for at least 10 seconds. Yes. Yes. That is like a throwback to middle school for me. I used to love zebra cakes. And then uh, I work with a, with a group of students from from England, and they came to Louisville. And one of them says zebra cakes. So now, now I kind of, I kind of can't eat them without You're fancy without making <laughs> yeah. that moment. I still like them. It's just they're just funny to me now. Zebra cakes. Now they're zebra cakes. Yeah, that's good. That's good. I love all those kind of little Debbie style snacks. That's so good. Yeah, it's so middle school. That and like, uh, flaming hot Cheetos. 
and, mm. or like hot fries. Those that's like the taste of middle school to me because we had that gas station right outside of middle school, and we'd all go in right before school and all that. So, uh, and I grew up in Lexington, so not too far. But um, lastly, I know you work with a lot of people. It might be the same people you just said. But what is a person, a project, or an organization that you think deserves a shout out? American Descendants of Slavery. It is an organization dedicated to the identification of black Americans who have been here for centuries, dedicated to the concentration of black Americans where we are getting specific political agendas and also dedicated to the reparations of black Americans where we are being paid for centuries of legal and illegal discrimination in housing mm-hmm. and health care and the economy and otherwise. So American Descendants of Slavery founded by Yvette Carnell, who's in Georgia, and Antonio Moore, who's in California. And Louisville is actually the hub of that movement. Louisville, Kentucky is the hub of that movement. We had the first conference here. We'll be having the second conference here at Simmons College of Kentucky, where I'm a professor. And also shout out to Dr. Kevin Cosby, Michael Hicks, the whole entire ADOS family that's located here, Christine Cosby, everybody. Man, I love it. I love it. And um, I think that's a good point here. Well, let's shift into your story a little bit. Go back as far as you can remember. And what are some of your earliest musical memories? Mixed CDs. There was always someone, whether it was in the barbershop, whether it was at the park, that was selling a mixed CD of some sort. Now, those mixed CDs... Like in the street mix CDs, like the urban quote unquote mix CDs would always have somebody mm-hmm. DJing and talking on top of the record. So they were kind of annoying. But I just remember those mix CDs that, that always had <clears throat> some of the top music being produced at that time. And fast forward and way through life, once we got into the Internet era and everything was at the tip of your fingers, I realized that Louisville was at a disadvantage culturally because we would get music so late. We would get music behind mm-hmm. everyone else. And, you know, so I just remember those mixtapes, those CDs. They were literally on cassette tapes, and then they went to uh, to compact disc at one point. Man. And who are some of those early artists? And, you know, who are the family members, the other people that are kind of, you know, putting these mix CDs in your hand and mixtapes and what other instruments did you start learning and picking up? And what was that early musical formation for you? So my great grandmother had 10 kids and we all grew up in a family church. So the first style of music that I was exposed to as far as live music goes, even as far as recorded music and playing it to a certain extent was gospel first and foremost. Mm. And from there outside of the church, Of course, there was a lot of soul music in my house, R&B music in my house, uh, hip hop music in my house. And my aunt, Nicole, actually listened to all sorts of other genres, but I didn't really pick up on other genres such as rock and roll or or really even pop music until later in life to like high school. But before then, just a lot of really stone cold black music. And... Were you picking up any instruments at that time or when did you first start getting into playing different things? Sixth grade band. I wanted to play snare drum like Nick Cannon from Drumline. And (laughs) and, uh, I always joke and say that they had us playing hot cross buns. And I was upset because it was just a a reality check. The drumline was, you know, fabrication of what it's like to be a percussionist. Yes. Yes. I did. Uh, I signed up in sixth grade. That's when I first signed up to do stuff. And uh, specifically, I was like, man, I want to play percussion. I want to play percussion. And right away they go, "Uh, too many percussionists. Uh, Can you play trumpet? I was like, I mean, I guess. So (laughs) luckily I thought Louis Armstrong was super cool randomly when I was in sixth grade. So I stuck with the trumpet all through high school. But uh, nowadays I'd last five minutes if I tried to play trumpet. But so you're playing in band. Do you do you do the marching band stuff or what other musical stuff do you start getting into in middle school and high school and kind of the things that become formative to push you towards pursuing music as a lifestyle and a career and and that stuff? 
So around that same time I'm joining band, I'm also exposed to hip hop from a different lens because I'm in recording studios with some of my family members. I am meeting my father around that same time and getting exposed to his side of the family who had a recording studio in their basement. And that really motivated me to want to record my own music, my own hip hop, produce my own music. So I saved up money for years from birthdays and Christmases. All I asked for was just give me money, give me money, give me money. I saved it up and purchased the Korg D1200, which is where my nickname came from. And I got that around age 12. And as I started producing my own music and learning how to use that device, I wanted to learn as much as I could about music theory and music production and just the nature of being a performer. So I joined marching band in high school. I was in our percussion ensemble, of course. I was in our drum line. I was in our concert band. I did everything that I could to expose myself to every sort of musical outlet. So that was during the school day. And then after school, we have rehearsals, of course. But after after school, I'm recording my homies. I'm making beats on my on my console, mm. doing everything that I can to just kind of dive into this musical world. And then before I graduated high school, I had to make a decision about whether or not I wanted to continue down that path of learning hip hop and producing music and going to full cell down in Florida to study recording mm. engineering or yep. I lived in Orlando. I know Full Sail very well. Right, right. Or going down this other path of uh, just studying music and getting classical training. And I decided to go down the classical route. And I'm really glad that I did because I would say that it opened up doors for me that I didn't even know were possible to get me to where I am today. Absolutely. I think your your music, your creativity, and everything you do is so influenced by that in an awesome and non-traditional way. And I love that how much you've kind of taken that and ran with it and made your identity part of that. But before we get into that, I do want to know, do you still have your old Korg 1200? Yeah, yeah I got it. Yep. And in, in fact, up until probably a year ago, every guest verse that I have recorded Anytime I needed to record voiceovers, do any sort of vocal recording, I would record it on that machine. And I just recently kind of packed it up. You know, I do most everything is done on computers nowadays with the audio mm -hmm. interface. But y'all yeah, never get rid of it. That is my baby. That made me who I am. <laughs> that's today. awesome. That's that's, that's my uh, that's my love. That's awesome. It's funny just because I kind of have like, you know, those like first guitars and everything. And it's just cool to see like the first, you know, recording studio thing. Um, so what, what were you, what were you hoping to get when you thought, okay, I'm going to dive in and I'm going to do this classical route um, versus like going to full sale and kind of sticking into the more uh, hip hop and popular music at the time, what were you hoping that would, it would do differently? I don't think I've ever said this out loud, but in the back of my mind, as I studied music at the University of Louisville, went through music theory, went through music literature, music history, every course that I took in the back of my mind, I was thinking, I'm going to take this knowledge and utilize it in the mainstream music industry. And over the course of those four years in undergrad, I fell in love with music education in a completely different way that I, I didn't realize was in me. And I knew that music had saved me because it kept me out of trouble while I got friends in the streets selling drugs, doing drugs, shooting. And, you know, I, I, I stayed away from that because I had music. I had band. I had drumline. And... I realized as I went through my undergraduate studies and I got to teach private lessons and do workshops and do master classes and clinics with other schools around the district, I felt it was a responsibility to return that favor to someone else who mm. looked like me and who came from where I was from. So I decided over the course of that four years, forget the music industry. In fact, I'm going to use the music industry to teach so now everything that i record compose produce is just a vehicle to teach 
And it's also a vehicle to learn because I truly believe as teachers, we're also learners, we're also students. Leonard Bernstein said, as I teach, I learn, and as, as I learn, I teach. And I truly believe that and I live by it. So over the course of undergraduate studies, I realized I would rather be a teacher first and a performer second. And then eventually I just kind of married the two together, just like I married hip hop mm -hmm. and classical music together. Yeah, I love how authentic and how integrated kind of all of these passions are. And it's funny, even following kind of your multiple social media accounts, it's interesting to see like the crossover and overlap. And I'm really excited to get into your campaign stuff in a minute. But before that, before we get there, so you did, it was a music, music ed for undergrad. Is that right? Yes, sir. And then you did music ed masters too, right? Yep. Masters of arts and teaching, music education emphasis. So school of music for undergraduate. And then I was mostly in the school of music, but really the college of education for my graduate degree. Sweet. That is the same exact degree that my wife got right after uh, undergrad as well. She did that for English. So, um, so after school, what are those first steps now that you've kind of had this radical life change and, you know, you thought you were going in for this one thing and now you've been transformed and you feel this weight and this responsibility to give back and to teach. What did those first few years look like in the classroom and stuff like that? Well, my transition into the professional teaching realm was unprecedented because I was already teaching Really, before I got into college, I was the drum major in my high school's marching band. I was running mm -hmm. rehearsals. I was writing cadences and running our drum line. So I had already had that experience in me. And then it just kind of carried on into college. When I studied music education, I continued doing private lessons. I continued working with marching bands and percussion ensembles. I continued teaching. So I was already positioned to teach. It was just going to become full time. At the same time, as a performer, I'm learning as much as I can and really playing catch up on the percussion side because I didn't take it as serious as I should have in middle and high school. Mm -hmm. So I'm playing catch up there. And then also the after after school, I'm still making hip hop music. I'm still recording my homies. I'm still making beats and selling beats, too. So I'm doing all of this at the same time. And eventually I kind of let go of some fears that I had about releasing music and performing as a hip hop artist. And I finally mm -hmm. just said, you know what, I'm going to do it. So I started performing with a group of foreign exchange students and jazz majors at the University of Louisville. And we had a band called Citizens United. And that band really stemmed from them seeing me out and about. I performed with uh, Jack Holiday and the Westerners. That's a rock band. So I started mm -hmm. rapping with a rock band rapping with a jazz band before I decided to go and do my own thing and, and really just own this uh, level of hip hop and intricacy as far as the way I wanted the music to come out. So I eventually did my own shows, kind of worked my my uh, different venues, smaller venues around town until I got the attention of uh, Teddy Abrams and Jalen Rose, who is now goes by the name James Lindsay. Teddy, of course, the the music director of the Louisville Orchestra. And I, I wasn't all the way ready to make that fusion work with hip hop and classical music. They were still kind of separate at that point. But mm -hmm. I did a music video in Comstock. And in that music video, I would definitely say I was a different hip hop artist. I was much more of the braggadocio, the very unfiltered and raw emotions and lyricism that we hear in so much hip hop. And we got in trouble for it. We got in trouble for a long list of reasons. But what that taught me was I can either use this moment and kind of make a decision and and go this route of just being a teacher and not worrying about hip hop and not utilizing that platform to teach the people that I grew up with and teach the kids that look like me. Or I could go this other route and kind of say F you to the school of music. So I, I had a choice where I, I you know, I, I was in a position where I had to choose, but instead of choosing, I just started, decided to start fusing. And that's when I mm. said, I'm going to put these two genres together. So that headliner show 
where I had the choir on stage and the string section was almost like a kid lashing out and throwing all their toys and beating on the floor and, and throwing a fit. That was me saying <laughs> <laughs> and, and doing what they want to do anyway. That was my fit. And you could really hear it in the, in the kind of music that I was making at that time anyway when I uh, sampled the Carl Orff pieces or when I was sampling the classical music, I was just mad. I was reacting to the system that I felt like didn't love me, that I loved so much, but I felt like didn't love me back. So mm. I was reacting in, in, that, in that moment musically. And then as I started to student teach and dive more, more into the education world, I realized how powerful that hip hop voice was because now I had kindergarten students looking me up on the internet. Now I had students mm. that, that I taught throughout college who were completely kind of sectioned off from that hip hop life, finding my music and finding interviews and finding videos of me performing. And I realized I had a genuine responsibility just as I had already realized to teach now I have a genuine responsibility to use that hip hop, use that music, that performance platform mm. to also teach. So I student taught at Height Elementary School for an entire semester, student taught at Mel for an entire semester. The kids at Height, the teachers at Height loved me so much they wanted me to come and take that job full time. So I graduated on a Sunday with my master's and I started teaching at Height before the school year was even over the very next day on Monday. <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. And, th and those two years, uh, we were really like just juggling the life of a performer and a teacher. Yeah. Was that all kind of blowing up at the same time? Yeah. And it was hard because I felt like everyone wanted me to choose. And it don't work that way. Was that, <laughs> was that part of, yeah, exactly. And, and I think especially... I feel like as you were figuring those things out, it's like, now the whole point of this is to be integrated and to be authentic and to choose both. But is that, uh, you were talking about earlier, part of the fears and uh, I guess like the vulnerability of that. What were some of those things that were holding you back before you started to, to go headlong into diving into the hip hop and diving into being a performer? Well, at first it was just a matter of confidence. And then it was mm -hmm. a matter of discomfort because when I'm rapping, I'm rapping from the perspective of a black man in America, someone who descends from slavery and Jim Crow and mass incarceration and the crack epidemic and police genocide. So I'm speaking about these issues in my lyrics. And meanwhile, I'm sitting in a music theory class where I'm the only black person. I'm sitting in a music mm -hmm. literature class where I'm the only black person and we're learning about music from George Handel, who invested in the slave trade. So my hip hop, mm -hmm. my hip hop was a, a conflict of interest because it called into question what I was learning in the school of music. And when I was at high elementary, my hip hop was a conflict of interest because I was in a predominantly white end of town east end of town in Middletown, where the resources mm -hmm. were significantly much more than where I was from, where I lived, where I wanted to work and where I wanted to teach. So eventually I left the district. I left Jefferson County Public Schools for that reason, because it was more important for me to teach the kids who looked like me, who needed me, not just the kids who wanted me, not just the the school that wanted me. I had to be where I was needed. So now I'm in a position where I can travel to any school I can work with any school, obviously not now because schools are shut down, but <laughs> I can work all over the district yeah. and, 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 and go to where is needed, go to where is needed. And I was doing that on my own for a while when I resigned, but then I got hired at Louisville Public Media to do that full time with a salary. And I'm no longer at Louisville Public Media, but I've maintained those relationships to the point where I can still do it anyway. Man, what an awesome story of just finding and refining and digging into, you know, a personal mission and a story of just laser focus. So what would you tell any musician? Uh, obviously there are a lot, this is a very kind of hot topic of personal intersections in music therapy and music therapy is another field that personally is like, 
I think it's like 85% female. And then most of those are white girls. So what would you say for someone that is navigating their own personal identity, their own intersections with the different cultures that they interact with? What encouragement would you give for someone challenging and going through those growing pains that you had to go through? You got to figure out the why. Because what I didn't mention through all of what I went through and my story musically was that outside of my music career and my teaching career, I have friends getting shot and killed. I have cousins getting killed Mm. by police officers. I have people overdosing. I have people dying from diseases. I have students getting shot and killed. And those reminders always contributed to my why because I want to better the conditions of my people. So maybe you didn't grow up where I grew up and maybe you have a different why. I don't know someone else's why, but you know your why. And it's important to keep that why in the forefront of your mission and your purpose. Anyone who talks to me about music and they use phrases like blow up, get a deal, getting rich, getting famous, I tune them out because it says <laughs> it says a lot about their why. If that's your why, then the music is not going to come across to the full effect of impacting someone's life the best that it can. You got to speak to people, speak to people's needs. You got to meet people's needs. You got to teach, you got to learn and everything in between. And if your goal is to get famous, then it's fleeting. You're, you're not going to have the music to its fullest caliber for a long period of time. It'll just kind of be like microwave music and then people will move on to the next best thing. Mm. Yeah, that kind of, that resonates real hard with me because one of my favorite populations to work with in music therapy is addiction recovery. And specifically, I get to work with this one uh, organization, Volunteers of America here in town. And it's guys that have been in prison for drug related crimes. And for me, they talk a lot about in music therapy, the idea of transference and counter transference in therapy and stuff like that. And for me, the transference that I feel as being a kid that grew up in a family that, you know, I saw people using drugs, you know, I have family members that have OD'd, you know, similar kind of uh, stories is what you're saying too. It's like, to me, it's like, I feel the weight, I feel the responsibility. And it's like, I've got to connect with these people. I got to give them hope so that they don't go out. And the first thing they do when they get done with this 30, 60 day program is use and then die. Cause even since working there since last June, I've had multiple guys that I hear like, it just breaks my heart. Literally. They're like, Oh, did you hear about so-and-so? Yeah. They died last week. It's like, guys, this is life and death, you know, like some people might be trying to blow up, quote unquote, you know, but there is life and death going on and tragedy going on and, you know, inequity and inequality and, you know, all these systems that you're talking about. So I think it's so cool to see the transparency in your music and it comes across just so refreshing, I guess is the word when I listen to your music and just like, I feel like the first time I listened through your album, I was like, I told like 10 people right away, like you need to listen to this like today, (laughs) like you need to go hear this. So describe your marriage of these classical styles. I mean, you've even got like harpsichord in some of your tracks and things like that. Describe that marriage and what that looks like and kind of your you know, unabashed, try and do and speak whatever artistry. Uh, I get bored easily when it comes <laughs> when it when it comes. I love it I love when it, it comes to music and art, and oftentimes I'm just underwhelmed with what I see and what I hear. So mm. I, when I'm making something, and I and I get underwhelmed with my own art. After a certain amount of time, you know, you could work on a song for however long or a composition for however long, and eventually you just I'm tired get, of looking at it. Yeah, yeah tired of listening to it. it. Yeah. I'm sick of this song. Uh, but yeah. <laughs> I know that when I make music, and and I really didn't have the wording 
in my head until I just heard it recently from my favorite producer, one of my favorite people in the world who uh, had a hand in executive producing Ars Nova, my latest, my latest project, Kojin mm-hmm. Toshiro. He said, a lot of people make music to escape. You make music to tell them to stop running. So when I'm making mm. when I'm making music, I'm I'm really just trying to present present issues and and hopefully spark some conversation around solutions, and and that's that. And and you know I hope that it also it bops and it's something that it's pleasant to listen to. It definitely does. It definitely <laughs> does. It does. I think it does all of those things. So, um. It seems like there's been this trajectory of you kind of becoming more and more involved. And I don't know if this is a good time to get into it yet, but um, I guess before we get into your campaign and everything that's going on, why do you feel like music connects so well for that, for that, you know, to stop running? Like we need to sit in this. We need to communicate these things. What do you think makes that medium so effective well it has been proven time after time that music Mm -hmm. engages someone at the maximum level in terms of remembering whether that's remembering subjects and facts uh, remembering anything and letting it live with you to the point where it's just ingrained in your brain and of course music education has different subjects rolled into it as a core subject and also just as a subject that helps push others. You know, you practice math when you perform rhythms and when you read rhythms, when you write rhythms, you're practicing language arts all the time when you're looking at breaking down text and analyzing the way that uh, other world languages are are put together. You're practicing science and sound waves and and harmonies and and pitches and tones. You're practicing everything within music. So... I oftentimes think back to what James Baldwin said, and he said, you cannot fix what you cannot face or something along those lines. And mm. and when I'm when I'm shouting, they can't take my hood. I'm screaming gentrification on top of a mm-hmm. Bach harpsichord and some trap drums. I need you to <laughs> I need you to sit with that. <laughs> I need you to sit yeah. with that and, and live with that that statement. And to a certain extent, also realize that, and, and it goes back to what I was saying about being a baby and throwing a fit, that song itself doesn't stop gentrification, but that song is going to educate people about gentrification and lead to us organizing and mobilizing around stopping it or fighting it or benefiting from it so that we don't get displaced. I live at 15th and Jefferson in Louisville, Kentucky. And right next to my house, there was a vacant home falling apart and two empty pavement lots. The city announced a program for homeowners to purchase vacant property and vacant lots for $500 as long as you maintained it and paid the property taxes. I qualified to purchase this vacant home and was denied. I qualified to purchase these vacant lots next to me and was denied. And then I turn around and the house gets torn down and construction starting for a store built by someone who's not even from the neighborhood and who might not even be from Louisville or really from this country. But they're coming into our neighborhood and they're going to benefit off of the people who live here. And that song hits so differently now when I perform it. I was already envisioning that gentrification happening, but now I'm. I'm a, a next door neighbor to it. So it's totally different, totally different. And it's t- still relevant to this day. And I make sure that when I'm making that music, I'm thinking about the now, thinking about the past, but also thinking about the future. Gentrification is relevant tomorrow, next week, a year from now. Because as long as I live in the Russell neighborhood, which is a historically black neighborhood, it's 90% black, but only 18% of the land is owned by people who actually live in Russell. You're going to hear me shout gentrification for the rest of my life. What would you say, how would you point somebody who gets stirred by your music, by your message? How would you tell somebody that wanted to build empathy and wanted to build knowledge? Where would you 
push someone into that? What do you hope people find as the next steps? Like you said, after the, after, like you said, it's the song, but it's where we go next. Where is next? Political engagement. And when I recorded Ars Nova and I rapped in the first song, we can organize or we can something about we can start a new movement. We just got to get organized. I didn't realize that movement was ADOS, the American Descendants of Slavery. I didn't realize that political engagement, which is the the basis of that movement, was so vital because up until that point, I had been somewhat apolitical. I had been told to vote my whole life, didn't know why. I had been told to care about politics my whole life, but didn't truly realize why. And so many of us, and by us, I mean Black Americans, don't truly understand why we need to be politically engaged. Well, I'm here to say, as a teacher, as a hip hop artist, as a community organizer and activist, you need to be politically engaged because your life depends on it. If we had a council person who put their foot down and said, we are not going to gentrify this neighborhood, the neighborhood would not be gentrified. But beyond that council person, because they're only one person, one human with one vote, if we had 10,000 people, which that's how many people roughly live in my neighborhood, who all banded together and said, we are not going to accept these changes. We need mm. to do something about it. We need to stop it. We need to fight it. Then we can impact change. Then we can come to, to some sort of solutions. But if we're not politically engaged, the problems will just exist and so many people ignore the problems or they don't think those problems impact them. And to go back to the comment about that one council person, Councilwoman Barbara Sexton Smith is someone who I respect and appreciate who's currently in our council seat. And she said to me that politicians only do what the people allow them to do, what they accept them of doing. So if she's not fighting gentrification, that's less of a fault of hers and more of a fault of ours because we have to hold her accountable for fighting it. Yeah, in a time where I feel like as information moves faster and faster and faster, um, it just seems like across the board, the electorate gets more and more and more disengaged. I mean, the news is depressing. You know what I mean? Like, it's hard to keep up. Somebody's getting impeached. Somebody's not getting impeached. You know, like, so what was that position? Because now that you're running this campaign for Metro City Council, uh, what was that shift that took you from going from that apolitical and not even on your radar to where you are now? It was without a doubt being exposed to the ADOS movement, the American descendants of slavery. And I was somewhat already in tune with the movement before I went to the conference. But once I went to that conference, I couldn't run from our issues anymore. I couldn't only rap about our issues. When I'm at that conference and I hear that we are only 13% of this country's population, but we are 40% of the prison population, 40% mm. of the homeless population, over 50% of the homeless family population, and have 2.6% of the wealth, I can't just rap about Black mm. issues anymore. Now I have to act on those issues. So I went from rapping on it to acting on it through this political engagement. And at the local level, one of the easiest entryways is through city council because anybody can run for it. And that's exactly why I'm running to impact our conditions. And we have all sorts of people who exist within our district, but majority of them are black. We have a nice chunk of white folks as well. We have Asians. We also have Hispanics in our district, but majority of our district is black and majority of those black people live at or below the poverty line. And that percentage of those living in poverty has decreased over my lifetime. I was born in 1992, 21% of black Louisville lived at or below the poverty line. Fast forward to today, 35% of black Louisville lives at or below the poverty line. I'm ready to do something about Jeez. that while in office. 
Yeah. So what what has been inspiring? I've been fascinated watching, uh, you know, your social media posts. But what has been inspiring for you? And I guess what are the next steps now? Because there was voting happening next month, but right. Yep, May 19th. And then that might May be, is that still happening or nah, <laughs> we don't know what's tomorrow. happening yet? So May 19th <laughs> is, my, is my 28th birthday. That's also Malcolm X's birthday. And I was somewhat anxious about having the election on my birthday because it could be the best day or the worst day <laughs> of my life. And, yeah. I, and I've already had some tragedy occur on my birthday. So I was I was not looking forward to it. But then it got pushed back to Tuesday june 23rd and i'm grateful for it because now i'm in a position where we have more time but the con to that is we can't knock on doors which is the the bread and butter of being able to win an election knocking on doors shaking hands and talking to people i'm at an advantage because so many folks already know who i am but I'm also at a disadvantage because so many folks already know who I am. So if, yeah. you, if, <laughs> if you know me, you might think, oh, he's just a, a, a rapper or oh, he's just a musician. He's just a loud, kind of crazy creative. But I'm really hoping that as people dive into this election, they get to understand who I am and what I have done and accomplished over the course of my life outside of really just rapping on a stage, which I think is easy to write someone off as especially a black man in america but i need people to realize me as a person jacory 1200 arthur professor arthur mr arthur i have been honored with dozens of accolades in education arts and community i've taught and served hundreds of schools and libraries and community centers and after school programs i've worked with hundreds of thousands of students locally regionally nationally and internationally teaching them I represented our hometown, Louisville, Kentucky, to an audience of over half a million people worldwide. I've organized over 100 local events. I've hired thousands of local vendors and organizers and artists. I have managed over a million dollars in funding. That is my experience, and that's what I hope that people take away what I've already done. And that's just within five years of my life. Imagine what I could do in four years from a Metro Council seat <laughs> with political power. Man, I feel like I'm watching this like person in stride right now, and I'm just pumped for the road ahead of you. Uh, looking ahead and looking at, I feel like education, music education, and just serving is so part of you. So my last two questions really are, how and why do you inspire others to make more music? I inspire others to make more music on the how tip by kind of breaking down the walls of being a musician. I have had mm -hmm. drum circles and song circles with people who I just meet on the street or people who kind of just walk up and I've done pop up drum circles around the city and parks and, and whatnot and outdoor venues. And it's important that people realize we're all really musicians. We all have that bone in us. We all have a creative spark inside of us. Sometimes people just got to twist that light bulb for you or flip the switch. So <laughs> <laughs> Maybe just a little bit, right? <laughs> yeah. So in terms of how we make music, we just we do it any way we can. Body percussion is essential yep. to my introductory into making people make music. And then the why, I don't know if you heard the ambulance driving by. I'm, a, I'm on West Jefferson Street, which is kind of a main street downtown, but ambulance is always driving by and then with the why any art but specifically music as we are biased musicians yes <laughs> music art makes you human you're not going to walk in the forest one day and see a bare brass band or see <laughs> Or see birds in a percussion ensemble. <laughs> you know what I mean? If you do, you better take a video. <laughs> right, yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you'll hear them making <laughs> their natural music and singing their natural songs and communicating. But we are a species, a special species when it comes to making art. And that art is reflective of our times from the past, the present, and the future. 
if the world mm-hmm. burned down right now and we had to save some of it, I guarantee we would be saving art. We'll save a lot of other artifacts, but can you even spell artifact without art? I don't, I don't think you can. Oh. I just I, I just made that up. So yeah, you can't have artifacts without art. They can art. take that one. That one's free. Yeah, yeah you can have that. I'm gonna write that in a bar. Right <laughs> <laughs> Man, well, kind of lastly, I saw your post recently. To end, since we're gonna post this in the middle of all of this COVID nineteen craziness. Talk a little bit about the Louisville Arts Network and the grants that are available for creators in Louisville. Shout out to Teddy Abrams of the Louisville Orchestra. Shout out to Owsley Brown of Owsley Brown Presents. Shout out to the Louisville Arts Network, a place where you as an artist can submit a proposal for any sort of practice or medium of art, whether that is painting with your with your mouth with a paintbrush in your mouth or burping the abcs or twerk videos to beethoven whatever <laughs> your artistic medium is we want you to submit a proposal at louisvilleartsnetwork.org and we will be in contact and we will get you paid we got stipends of 150 dollars or 200 dollars to you know get you some groceries or put some gas in your car even though you ain't supposed to be going nowhere so louisvilleartsnetwork.org we're trying to pay artists in their time of need Man, I love it. Well, I'm grateful that you and I both got together. Next time, we'll have to make it happen in person. I'm looking forward to seeing the rest of your campaign play out. And it's just been a blast, man. So thanks for coming on. Great to have another Cards alum. So where do you want people to find uh, your stuff, whether it's your music, your campaign stuff? Where do you want to push people to when they're surfing the World Wide Web to find all of the stuff you're doing jacoryarthur.com that's j-e-c-o-r-e-y a-r-t-h-u-r.com for everything political everything community and for everything else music arts related 1200llc.com but the two are kind of intermingled so you'll find one and be able to find the other no problem hmm I love it, man. Well, thanks for spending this Tuesday, or sorry, no, it's Wednesday. Thanks for spending this Wednesday night with me. Uh, Both of our kids decided to be gracious to us and uh, not give us a hard time during this. So we'll go back to dadding. I appreciate it, man. Uh, Anything else you want to say before we go? Thank you for having me, Chris. I appreciate you. Absolutely, bro. Well, uh, for Ja'Cory and Chris, remember everybody, give more grace, share more love, and make more music all right i hope you enjoyed that chat with your Corey. if you want to hear about any of the links that he talked about uh links to his websites his campaign website the american descendants of slavery uh the louisville artist network that's all in the show notes if you click in your podcast player and while you're there please give us a rating and review or the best freest way you could help the show is by telling someone you know just letting somebody know um we have a good back catalog of episodes we're starting to build up so while you're at home check out some episodes share it with a friend tag us on instagram at make.more.music and hit us up if you know somebody who you think would be great to be on the show thanks for listening today and remember everybody give more grace share more love, and make more music.